I'm grateful to be a member of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I'm grateful to be an alcoholic. And in case you're wondering, because a lot of times new people say, like I did, okay, the guy says he's a grateful alcoholic, because he doesn't mean he's, he means he's, he's grateful he got his driver's license back, you know, he's, he's, uh, he's grateful that, uh, grateful he gets to sleep in the big bed, you know, I <laughs> got to keep his job. Uh, I really mean I'm literally grateful to be an alcoholic. I'm absolutely positive that my life today is better because I'm an alcoholic than if I hadn't been an alcoholic. And if you're new and that sounds stupid to you, I understand it. It sounded stupid to me. First time I heard somebody say, uh, I'm a grateful alcoholic, I thought, and a moron. You're a moron, too. <laughs> you're an idiot. And I have, it's, it's important to remember what it felt like to be new, because I'm sober 28 years. And, uh, you know, and it's easy to forget. Uh, and I was thinking, <laughs> uh, welcome, Paula. Uh, I sometimes I think when we have these countdowns and we're all so excited about the new person, the fresh blood on the vine, you know, uh, uh, <laughs> you're the future of Alcoholics Anonymous. And if you're new, you're going, I don't, I don't, <laughs> I'd rather not get up there in front of all these people if you don't mind. No, no, come on up. You have to do this. You know, <laughs> we're going to give you a book. I don't care. I'll buy one. I, just, uh, <laughs> leave, just leave me alone. I just want to sit here and fade into the furniture and... and uh, so welcome, Paula. And what I, the one I identified with is the person with three days back in this corner. Because he or she, I didn't see who it was, but had to go through all of that. Oh, no, no, I can't get up there. I'm, I'm brand new. Oh, my God, I'm just, I, 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 I can't. I, and then, you know, then your head says, you said you would do anything. Yeah, that's true. Okay, I, all right, all right, I'll go, I'll go up. And then all of a sudden they say, no, it's not three days, it's two days. <laughs> <laughs> then all of a sudden it goes from I can't do that to wait a minute, what about me? <laughs> you know, and like I said, I'm, I'm 28 and a half years sober and, and, uh, and I still got that what about me going on, you know, it's, uh, uh, but I, uh, I'm very excited to be here for the 36th anniversary of the Hilton Head Midwinter Conference and, and, uh, uh, I love your, uh, I love your your uh, your theme. You know, life will take on new meaning. Life will take on new meaning. It's one of those things in the promises that we hear and you go, yeah, yeah, yeah. And then all of a sudden it happens for us. That's what that means. That's what that means. Life will take on new meaning. And uh, so I'm I'm very honored whenever I get asked to do this. And my wife Carla and I, uh, for whatever reason, get asked to do this um, frequently. And and uh, it's uh, it's. It's a uh, it's an honor that uh, that I, ca I can't express how grateful I am for. I didn't I didn't even know that people were ever asked to come out of their home state to some place and talk to AA uh, people. And I'm not I know some people stand at podiums like this and and they deliver a great message and but they don't like doing it. They hate to do it. They'd rather just be a person making the coffee or sweeping the floors or setting up the chairs. Um, and, and and they're uncomfortable, but they deliver such a great message that people just float out of the room. Sometimes, you know, uh, like uh, uh, nobody would would drink, you know, be, between here and and uh, it's Charleston. Uh, I mean, uh, you know, uh, uh, but they hate doing it. I'm not that guy. I'm the guy who wanted to be the speaker at the first meeting I ever went to. Uh, that's just. <laughs> That's just the way I'm wired, so I like doing this. They didn't ask me. I was a little drunk that night. <laughs> but, uh, but gosh, I love doing it, and I, I love the opportunity. Um, and uh, <laughs> when Carla and I first got together, we, were, we had dated for two or three weeks when uh, one of us, I don't even remember which one, said, listen, you know, um, I've had... Uh, personal uh, relationships damaged by uh, being of service. And I want you to know, when they call, I go. And whichever one of us didn't say it said, yeah, that's what I do. So that's what we do. And now we get to do it together a little, uh, in fact, quite a lot. And, and, uh, and it's just, it's so flattering. Uh, but uh, if you're new, sometimes the, the speaker seems like some um, upper class of Alcoholics Anonymous. And that's never the case. 
Uh, I know I know the other speakers uh, that were invited, and uh, uh, Bill and Matthew and Magdalena, uh, um, who are just members. They're members, you know, and uh, and and good people and good friends. I, I love them, and and my wife Carla, uh, the same. And and uh, so I want to. Thank uh, It's funny. You come sometimes. You come to think somebody picks you up at the airport. Oh, and they have a sign with your name on it. Sometimes you know, and and then they and you get to your hotel room. And sometimes they'll have a fruit basket or you know chocolates or flowers or something, and you just want to go. I'm, I don't know if you understand. I'm just I'm a guy who just. I didn't invent anything, you know. I just kind of uh, spent my most of my life uh, screwing up everything I ever touched and hurting everybody that ever cared about me. Yeah, yeah, tell us about that. And and uh, <laughs> my sponsor Bob Bazant says uh, we're we're a, a, an organization of losers. You know, nobody comes here on a winning streak. And. Uh, uh, so I want to. It's good to see Lee, my, my friend Lee. We share a sponsor, and uh, uh, and I want to thank Dano and Taylor for picking us up at the airport, and I want to thank Bill for inviting us, uh, and uh, you know, and to see good friends uh, Vivian and and uh, my friend George from from L.A. and and uh, just you know, and, and a bunch of new friends too. Um, we we. Uh, <laughs> We we knew we were coming here for a long time, and the flight was was booked for quite a while. And I called American Airlines Thursday morning to check in because you you know you can check in online 24 hours before the flight. So I called them, or I went online, and um, there was no check-in option. There was you know email the itinerary and do this and print it out and whatever, but there was no check-in. So I kept trying to get it. Finally, I called American Airlines, and they put me on hold because. The the half the nation or a quarter of the nation is you know uh, flights are canceled because of the the weather, and uh, so when I finally got somebody, he said, "Oh, I see why you can't check in. That flight is canceled." <laughs> so, well, we we have to uh, be in North Carolina uh, or South Carolina um, tomorrow. So. Um, uh, what can you do about that? And he said, well, we can fly you into Savannah on Saturday. I said, that's not good. Uh, <laughs> we, <laughs> we're supposed to be there. So they managed to, and I called, uh, I called Bill and talked to his wife, Diana, and, and uh, we were <laughs> trying to get things worked out. And finally they flew us through Dallas into Savannah, and, and uh, Dano and, and Taylor drove down to Savannah to pick us up. So we managed to get here, and these things always seem to get worked out. And if they don't, uh, <laughs> some of you have heard uh, Ken D, who, uh, who is a great speaker, and he said one time he was supposed to talk in Houston, and uh, he got on a flight from San Diego, and they went to Salt Lake City, and then uh, because of the weather, they were postponed. And, uh, you know, you start talking to somebody sitting next to you on the plane, and where are you going, and what are you doing there, and, oh, I'm speaking at a conference, oh, what kind of conference, oh, it's Alcoholics Anonymous, you know, and... And sometimes they go, good for you, you know, like you just <laughs> just told them you just won second place in the Special Olympics or something. And, and uh, uh, <laughs> but but uh, Ken said he was sitting in Salt Lake City and this guy said, uh, when are you supposed to speak at this conference? And he said, tonight. And he said, what time? It's eight o'clock. He said, well, you're, you're not going to make it. He said, nope, nope, not going to make it. And the uh, <laughs> guy said... Well, uh, what are they going to do? He said, they'll get somebody else. You know, there's a thousand people there. Somebody, anybody, anybody there can give the talk. <laughs> and the guy said, well, if anybody in Houston can give the talk, why are they flying you in from San Diego? And Ken said, I, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> so... But I'm grateful that I get to do this, uh, and, uh, and it's fun to be here with you. You know, I, I don't know why I'm an alcoholic. Um, my, uh, my home group is called the Winner's Attitude Adjustment Group of Alcoholics Anonymous. We meet every day of the year at 7 a.m. in uh, Studio City, California. It's part of Los Angeles. Tahunga, where C Carla and I live, is part of Los Angeles. And uh, Tahunga is interesting. It's a, it's a, it's a Spanish spelling. It's a, the, H sound is a J, 
but it's an Indian word, so it's not a Spanish word. You can't look it up in the Spanish dictionary. T-U-J-U-N-G-A. Evidently, it means where'd all these damn Harleys come from? And um, uh, so uh, we're. Uh, but like I was saying, I don't know why I'm an alcoholic. I um, I don't come from an alcoholic family. I'm the oldest of four kids, the only boy. And the only alcoholic in my immediate family, as far as I know, my dad, my dad likes his beer. He, he would, uh, my dad liked to have a, a beer, you know, uh, um, but the, the thought of drinking so much beer that it affects your walking and your speech and your driving is just insane. Why would anybody do that? See, I'm just the opposite. I'm like a, my dad would buy like a six pack of beer on a Saturday and, uh, stop what he's doing if he's working on a car or working in the yard or watching TV or whatever and have a beer and then go back to what he was doing which I don't understand that if I if I stop and have a beer that's what I'm doing and uh, whatever I was doing before couldn't have been very important or why would I stop and have a beer so um, but uh, my dad just, that's just the way he is you know he, so um, he didn't understand the way I drank I don't understand the way he drank and uh, my mother may be an alcoholic we don't know we couldn't tell there's no way to tell because you won't drink. And um, <laughs> that's the best way to tell, really, is to watch how they drink. And if, uh, well, after I got sober and I was very interested to find out why I'm an alcoholic, it's a useless piece of information anyway. Uh, there, there used to be a, a Catholic priest from Alabama named Father Hillary. Some of you may have known him. Um, Father Hillary would say, it don't matter how the jackass got in the ditch, Lim. Get him out. And, uh, <laughs> and that, that makes sense. Uh, but I just, you know, I just wanted to know because I drank with some people who I know I was smarter than they are. I just knew it. You know when you are, and, but they could stop drinking. And so it doesn't have anything to do with how smart you are. Um, or, or, or your resolve, you know, okay, I can stop, I can have a beer, but I, 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 I have a shot of whiskey, but just one, you know, just, just a, I don't, I don't know if I ever said just one, but maybe just a couple, and, uh, and then I really got to go. And then, you know, once you start, it's like Chuck C. said, I don't start a fire to put it out, uh, and uh, uh, so, so I just, I don't know why I'm an alcoholic, but uh, um, so I asked. But I was very interested to find out why. So I, I started looking at this and listening to people sharing. And I said to my mother, why don't you drink? And she said, why do you care? <laughs> I said, well, are you an alcoholic? And she said, am, am I an alcoholic? Have you ever seen me take a drink ever? No, that's, but I know hundreds of alcoholics that don't drink. Why don't you drink? Are you an alcoholic? She said, why, why are you asking me this? I said, okay, I'll tell you why, because there's such a thing as a genetic predisposition, and it may be your fault I'm a drunk. So, <laughs> and she had pretty much the same response you just had. Uh, and she said, so it might be my fault. And she said, I'll tell you what my deal is. When I was young, I drank. And every time I drank, uh, I got sick, stupid, and obnoxious. So I stopped. And I said, you got to drink through that, Mom. You know. Uh, <laughs> That part wasn't shocking to me. It's just that uh, she doesn't understand the promised land lies beyond six stupid and obnoxious. Uh, she, she didn't have the tenacity to make this program. My mother just passed away uh, this, uh, the end of last year. Let me tell you something. A lot of times, um, I've been going to meetings for a long time, and it seems like every time around the end of the year or the beginning of a new year, there's always somebody in a participation meeting that will say, I'm so glad to see this year end and move on to the next year, as if moving from 2015 to another number, 2016, is going to change the conditions of the world, you know, and... Uh,
A friend of mine said that to me. A friend of mine said, I said, Happy New Year. She goes, Oh, I hope it is. And she's sober a while, so sober 15, 16 years. And, and, uh, and she had a horrendous story. Uh, and, and, uh, and she's doing, she's doing great. But I, I said, she said, uh, I'm just so glad to see 2015 in the rearview mirror, aren't you? I said, I, I don't, was it, uh, the whole year was bad for you? <laughs> she said, Oh, God, yeah. I said, How about you? I said, Well, you know, I could present it in a way that would make it sound like it was a bad year. And there were things that happened in the year. Uh, my sister, who was born on my second birthday, she's my, my younger sister, uh, got cancer. She had to have her leg uh, removed, and then the cancer spread. And she ended up, this May, she passed away. Um, and so I lost my sister in May. And my sponsor, Dick Martin, died in September. And... Uh, and then my mother died in November. So uh, if I wanted to present it in that way, oh my God, my sister died and my sponsor died and my mother died. That was um, three events that happened in 2015. Overall, 2015 was a good year, just like 2014 was a good year, just like 2013 was a good year. And, uh, you know, I, I don't have bad years. I got some days that I don't care about having repeating, you know. I'm not, you'll never hear me say I wouldn't trade my, my best days drinking for my worst days sober. <laughs> I'm not one of those guys. Uh, <laughs> I have, I've had some kind of miserable days in sobriety and I've, and I had some great days drinking. Uh, by the way, when I say using, let me clear this up. I'm an, um, I'm an alcoholic to the core. All my recovery is in Alcoholics Anonymous, uh, and uh, Alcoholics Anonymous is not a drug treatment program. Uh, however, if you're an alcoholic, like I am, you work these 12 steps on your alcoholism, it does wonders for your drug addiction. Uh, <laughs> it's, just, it's just kind of a side effect, you know. Uh, Carla, my wife Carla, uh, says it uh, the best I've ever heard. She said, mentioning drugs in an AA meeting is not a violation of the fifth tradition. Not mentioning alcohol is a violation of the fifth tradition. And, uh, and that's as well as I've ever heard it said. And, uh, and my drug addiction is a thing of the past. Uh, it's an outside issue, but it seems to be controversial anyway. Uh, it's not a, it's not a work program, but we talk about employment. We talk about, I was a bad employee. I was a bad employer. I had a bad employer. I had a bad employee. I was a bad work. I was a good work, whatever. Um, but, uh, nobody seems to mind if we talk about working or parenting or driving. Oh my God. Uh, driving is an outside issue and yet the streets of Hilton Head are so much safer because we're in here. <laughs> <laughs> that if we were out there motoring around with a bottle between our knees. So, um, so it's just, <laughs> however, and I enjoy drugs. I use, I only use um, every drug I ever heard of, um, <laughs> except for ones I've heard of since I got sober, you know. And I don't use those, but I wonder, you know. <laughs> That's why I hang out with new people, you know. Hey, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. Did you ever do any of that ecstasy? Because uh, ecstasy is a good name for a drug. I don't know. Uh, you know, you get these new guys go, yeah, man, yeah. <laughs> I did. How was that? Uh, <laughs> so anyway, uh, I, uh, my, my first drink, uh, I didn't even tend to have it. I, I, I told you, but there wasn't any drinking specifically in my family, so I don't come from an alcoholic family. I didn't start drinking too young. My first drink, uh, I had friends in high school that drank. I just didn't care about it. It didn't look attractive to me. And, uh, uh, but my friend Morris, who was kind of my sexual sponsor, said, look, if you want to get a home run with this girl, you're going to have to get her drunk. And uh, I'm, I could follow directions, you know, I mean, like, like a... And, I, and that seemed like a good thing. Yeah, I wanted to do that. Because we, we used to use those baseball terms, you know, first base, second base, third base, and home run. I don't even remember where the bases are now. Because uh, uh, not enough bases in the first place, you know. And, and uh, it seemed like there ought to be like nine or ten bases. But, uh, but uh, anyway, uh, but I remember home run. That was a real important one. And uh, Morris said, if you want to get a home run with this girl, you have to get her drunk. So... I went and stole a quart of Rainier Ale, which was the national beverage of Garden Grove, California, where I grew up. That's what all my guys drank. I got this quart of Rainier Ale, and we went and parked by the railroad track, and we'd been there before. We'd done some necking and petting and, 
And But now I got my ammunition, and I still didn't care about drinking. I'm tempted to drink, but I would have been happy to say, here, drink this and let me know when you're ready. Um, <laughs> Just seemed rude, so I, you know, so I opened it and I took a pull and I handed it to her and she drank some. And then she handed it back and we sat there and talked and kissed and passed this bottle back and forth. And it turned out one thing led to another and uh, it was the first time I ever had an alcoholic buzz. And I liked it. It was, it was, it felt loose and fun and, and free and, and, uh, and happy and, uh, and it, I guess it did the same thing to her. So Morris was right. This is the first time I ever had, uh, an alcoholic high and the first time I ever had sex in front of a witness. So, <laughs> so I just, <laughs> I don't remember articulating it, but at some point that night I said, this, I'm going to do both of these things much as I can the rest of my life. Uh, it, it changed my life, you know. Uh, it was a, a pivotal point. But um, I, uh, I went into the music business. I made mu- money making music for a while. And, uh, and, then, um, and then I got a job as a... a so, well, I've worked a whole bunch of different jobs. But I, 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 25 years I was a prop man, uh, stagehand in L.A. for... Um, television and uh, uh, so I retired from that and I spent half of that time I was loaded and half of it I was sober and uh, and I worked on uh, on a lot of shows and and uh, at some point I when I first got into that business I got a pretty good reputation because I, I was uh, I was I paid attention you know and like and I you know was smart I'm a figure outer so uh um, I could take direction and uh, and you know be where I was supposed to be and 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 so I got a good reputation and then I started to lose it because I either didn't show up or I show up later or I show up drunk one time I showed up drunk I was a head prop on on a on a a show at CBS and I I didn't come in I was too drunk so I didn't I didn't call because I they, I knew they'd think I was drunk I went in the next day and I said geez I had where were you yesterday well I had had uh, food poisoning I just said uh, well you couldn't call you know I said I'm sorry and he said sorry hell you're out of here you're, you're, we, we got by without you we don't need you so then a friend of mine who was the head prop on another show at ABC got me in as his second hand and I was there for a while then I got drunk one night same thing but now I learned my lesson so I went in and that didn't see <laughs> that seemed like you know it seems like they're really they're out to get alcoholics like you show up you're you don't show up, they fire. You show up, they fire. You, you know, but uh, but things started to get out of hand. And I had a couple of friends who were getting sober and Alcoholics Anonymous, and and uh, um, so I'm watching them. But things were getting really getting out of hand. I, I didn't show up for my daughter. Uh, at, I had a, a daughter. I was uh, married to this woman, and uh, we had uh, this little girl. And when she was about three years old, her mother had all she could take of me and said, no, I'm, I'm done. We're, we're done. And we weren't, we weren't married, so we just split up. But I stayed in my daughter's life, and, and she, uh, her mother remarried, and, and uh, I, I stayed friends with them, with, with her mother and, and, her, and her stepfather. And so I was welcome in their home. And, but I, I, sometimes I just, uh, I, you know, I, I couldn't stop drinking. Uh, one time I was supposed to pick my daughter up, and she was like 12 years old. I was supposed to pick her up at noon on a Saturday. We were going to spend the day together, see a movie, go to dinner, spend the night at my house. I bring her back Sunday evening. And uh, that was the plan. We were both looking forward to it. When I got over to her house, I was there at noon on Saturday, drunk. And I didn't mean to be drunk. I knew I was drunk and I, damn it, I did it again. And uh, so I tried to act like I wasn't and I didn't fool anybody. And uh, I wasn't there five minutes when her stepfather walked me out on the front porch and he said, Doug, you're drunk. I, I am. And he said, uh, damn it. You know, Star was really looking forward to this. I said, I, 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 me too. And he said, I can't let her get in the car with you. And I, I understood that. I said, yeah, I get, I get it. And he said, uh, let me make this clear. You're welcome in our home anytime. Sober. Don't come over here drunk anymore. It's very hard on Star. Boy, those words are like 
like branded on my brain. You know, I can just picture him right this moment saying that. You're welcome in our home anytime sober. Don't come over here drunk anymore. It's hard on Star. Hard on my daughter. He's protecting my child from me. He didn't say, don't come over here drunk. We're afraid you're going to break our furniture, embarrass us in front of the neighbors, or fall in the pool. He's protecting my only child from me, which is what he should do. I understood every bit of that. And it broke my heart. Because I had good parents. I wanted to be a good parent. I wanted very much to be a good parent. I had good examples. And I just couldn't do it. I couldn't not show up drunk. And I got in the car. I said, it won't happen again. He said, I hope not. I got in the car and I started to drive home and I got halfway down the block and my sis, I couldn't hold back the tears. The, the, the pain in my heart was so bad, the tears just came like Niagara Falls and I couldn't even see to drive. I'm like, I turned on the windshield wipers. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Seemed like a good idea, but it didn't help. And uh, So I got a couple blocks away and I pulled into this parking lot, a little strip mall, and I just opened the door and I put my feet on the pavement and put my head in my hands and I sobbed like a baby. I couldn't stand the pain and uh, the disappointment in myself. And I looked up and I saw this red neon sign. It said liquor. And I got out of the car and I walked in that liquor store and I bought a pint of whiskey. And I came back to the par- car and I sat in the car and I opened that bottle. And I had a couple of pulls. And I was okay. I was okay. See, there are heads nodding in here. Of course there are, because you are the ones who understand. If I tell this story at a PTA meeting, uh, (laughs) you know, they look at you like you're an unfit parent, you know, like, uh, excuse me, sir. I don't know that I understood you. It sounded like you said you were so distraught over your drinking that you drank. (laughs) That's right, lady, and then I could drive. I hope you weren't on Tampa Avenue that day, because I'm literally a danger to myself and others. (laughs) But you understand. You're the only ones who understand. It's hard for... How can anybody understand it if they're not an alcoholic? It's like when Bob and Bill went to visit uh, Bill D., Alcoholics Anonymous number one, number three, in the hospital. And, and he said, listen, thanks you guys for coming, but uh, people have talked to me about my drinking. It doesn't do any good. I usually drink on the way home from the hospital. They said, we don't, we don't, we don't come to talk about your drinking. We came to tell you about our drinking. And they did, and he got it. And they came back the next day when Bill D.'s wife was there. And Bill said, these are the guys I told you about, the ones who understand. That's what you are. You're the ones who understand. That's what I am. I'm the ones who understand you. You know. If you heard Carla this morning and Matthew last night, and when you hear Bill tomorrow, somebody in our life was the one who understood, and we understood that they understood. And uh, and it's, it's you know it's it's a miracle. I mean before before Alcoholics Anonymous, people used to die right and left of these things. Good people, because they couldn't control their drinking, and nobody understood why. But my life was spinning out of control. I went skiing up at Mammoth with a friend of mine. I skied off a cliff, and uh, because the way I like to ski, I like to get on the lifts about 8:30 when they first open, and. Um, uh, when the snow's all fresh, you know, all groomed, and, and uh, be the first ones up at the top of the hill, and I get on there, and I take take my uh, gloves off and hook them on my vest, and I reach over here and get my little flask of whiskey and have a little shot of that whiskey, and then I reach over here and do a little one and one wake up, you know, and then I get off my windless pipe and fire that baby up and enjoy the scenery, you know, and... Uh, Get up to the top and get off and make sure my bindings are all right. Pull out my boater bag. Have a little shot of water, whiskey. I mean, uh, uh, rum. I don't know. White wine. Uh, boater bag. Boater bag has white wine. So um, you have to keep these things separate. So, um, and then ski down the hill. And I'm loose and I'm free. You know, I'm like it seemed like a, uh, I skied better loaded. But the problem is if you do that on every run, after about 20 to 30 runs, <laughs> you're really in no condition to be involved in an athletic event. And uh, 
So I, I skied off this cliff, and I, um, I, it, it, you'd think, like, if I didn't explain it to you, you'd think it was an accident. No, no, I thought I could make it. Um, <laughs> I could have turned left, like most people were doing, but uh, it's just there was a cliff there, and it was right after the Winter Olympics, and... Uh, you know when those Winter Olympics guys, they go, they're airborne and they, they lean way over the front of their skis and they look like a bird? I didn't do that. I thought that was for looks. Uh, there's a reason they all do that. If you don't do that, for some reason, your skis will go straight up in the air. And then you're heading towards the planet with your skis on the top and your head on the bottom, which is never recommended. And... Uh, so I landed upside down. Fortunately, my shoulder hit before my head did, and I broke my shoulder, and the ski patrol took me down. They put me in the hospital. They operated on my shoulder. I'm out of work for six weeks, and uh, I just got back to work. I'm back to work about a month or two, and uh, somebody had a party that lasted all night long. And uh, in the morning, there was just a few of us left, about four of us left, and the woman who owned the house said, if somebody will take me to the store and get some eggs, I'll make breakfast. So I said, I'll do it, and I got my Harley parked across the driveway, so we went out and we got on the scooter, started to go get eggs. I don't know why I thought eggs and Harley was a good combination, but, uh, uh, but now we're going down the road, and it's like sunrise. The sun is just spreading across the horizon, you know, you know how it does, it. just starting to light up the sky a little bit, it's a beautiful scene, and... Um, uh, and, and it was April, April in Southern California. It's not hot, it's not cold, it's brisk, you know, at sunrise. And, and, the, and it was before the California had a helmet law, so our hair is flying in the air. We got that Harley rumble going on and there's no traffic. And, and uh, so uh, we both had the same idea. It was like, this is so sexy, we should make love in the great outdoors. Um, it seemed like just, a, it was like a, a thought that came to both of us, like mental telepathy. <laughs> And uh, so, but I don't, I don't know if you're familiar with downtown Burbank, uh, but it's, uh, <laughs> not an area with a lot of uh, outdoor lovemaking venues. Uh, we managed to find a four-story parking structure, and uh, that, uh, <laughs> that helped. <laughs> we could go up and have the top of that four-story parking structure where nobody could see us. We'd still have the sky open, and it just seemed beautiful. But then the gate was that was barred up. The gate was locked. So we went around to the fire escape and parked the bike and went up the fire escape and uh, got to the top of the fire escape, and that door is locked. But I'm kind of bright, you know, so I, uh, I know that the door to the fire escape, of course, is unlocked from the inside. So I jumped up on the wall, and I'm going to swing over and open that door, and then we'll have the whole top to ourselves. And I got the jump all right. I'm hanging from the wall, and I know somehow I'm going to get over. I'm trying to do a pull-up, but I can't quite do that. I'm swinging back and forth. I know some, I always manage to, I almost always manage uh, to <laughs> come out of these things. But this time, um, I remember seeing the, the wall going up, and... Um, <laughs> Quickly, I figured out this is a stationary wall. It can't be going up. I must be going down, and so, um, so I fell 54 feet, and uh, I landed feet first. And then, of course, when I landed, my knees buckled, and my foot came up. I kicked myself in the ass. Is what happened, and <laughs> broke my pelvis in two places, and s snapped the heel bone off my right foot, and shoved it through my foot like a bowling ball. And just broke all those little bones in your foot, you know. And uh, so I didn't walk away from that one. But here's the deal. <laughs> God has always been with me, whether I recognize it or not. This happened to be the parking structure of St. Joseph's Hospital. So, <laughs> so the gal who was with me ran into the ER and she said, help, help me, my friend just fell off your parking lot and it broke him. And uh, he's easy to find. He's crumpled up at the bottom of the fire escape there and uh, so they came out and got me and put me in the trauma center and uh, I would be in and out of consciousness it turned out I had a 0 .40 blood alcohol level and later on I thought well, I was pretty good driving that motorcycle over there barefoot you know with uh, as drunk as I was <laughs> and I almost made the jump and uh, uh, <laughs> So I was in the hospital for 10 days while they tried to figure out what to do with my foot. They had to reconstruct it. And uh, um, 
friends would bring me in gifts, you know, and uh, it never occurred to me to say to the doctors, look, I know you're giving me Demerol and Percodan for the pain, thank you. I'm self-administering Irish whiskey and cocaine, is that going to be a conflict? Uh, <laughs> And I thought, well, if it is, you know, I'm in a hospital. It's not like they have to come find me someplace. So uh, anyway, I got out of there. It took me five months to learn to walk uh, and uh, without crutches or a cane or something. And so my friend Teddy got sober. And and Teddy, would, she was great. She was a dangerous drunk. She was, she was really fun to drink and use with, but she was dangerous. She would, you know, start a fight that you had to finish and... And she'd do things like that, you know, and uh, take a swing at somebody. And because, I, you know, you're with her, well, what are you going to do? And so, uh, you know, she's just kidding, you know. And uh, uh, so, but Teddy got sober and she turned into a lady almost immediately. Just so quick, you know. I mean, uh, she wasn't dangerous anymore. And she was, she was really smart and funny. Now she's just smart and funny and sober and dependable. She'd show up. She'd be where she said she was going to be when she said she was going to be there, dressed appropriately and speaking in whole sentences. And, uh, and I was impressed with that. I was glad for her. Uh, and I told her, I'm really happy for you. And, and, but every time you talk to her, she'd say something like big book or meeting or sponsor or something. And finally I said, look, I don't know. If, shut up. Uh, <laughs> I don't know if you're trying to draft me into your organization or whatever, but, you know, I'll tell you this, Ted, if I ever see alcohol interfering with my life, I probably will go to AA. <laughs> and she was with me through all that stuff. She said, if you ever see it interfering with your life, my God, Doug, what would you call interference? Brain death? <laughs> and I said, okay, I see where you're going with this, you know, but... Um, I don't think that accidents should count. Uh, seriously, anybody fall off a four-story building drunk or sober, you're going to get hurt. I mean, uh, being drunk may have saved my life for all I know. Uh, you know, you, you got alcoholism mixed up with gravity, honey. And, and uh, so she just gave up. I'm she's okay, whatever. And she went home. But all that week, whenever I had a little quiet moment, you know, like you have these little quiet meditation moments, I'd picture Teddy's face saying, what would you call interference, brain death? And I started thinking about it. Like any of those the accidents I told you about could easily have ended in brain death. I didn't have any control over that. There were other ones that also could have ended in brain death. There'd be a, the next one may end up in brain death, and there'll be a next one. I understood all of that, and I started to scare me a little bit. Then it started to scare me a lot. I could end up... Because of my drinking, because I won't stop drinking, it could end up in a bed or a wheelchair the rest of my life, unable to feed myself or go to the bathroom by myself and know it. That's the scariest part, and know it. And the more I thought about it, the more it scared me. And I rushed right down to AA three years later. Uh, and, uh, <laughs> People call me compulsive. <laughs> no. <laughs> Some things, uh, but um, not so much recovery. And um, so I went to my first meeting. Somebody told me, go to a big speaker meeting. They'll leave you alone to lie. Um, I went there, and I, I didn't, the meeting started at 8.30, but I didn't know what time it started, so I got there at 6.30. It was at the, a community room, a subterranean community room in the Valley Presbyterian Hospital in the San Fernando Valley. And I got there early, and I'm watching. There were people there. They're setting up chairs. They're making coffee. They're setting up the literature. They're all hugging and laughing. And I'm just uh, sort of put off by it, but I'm amused by it, too. And I'm leaning against the wall over by the double doors. And um, people would come up to me and go, are you new? And I'd say, no, I'm not. And most of them would walk away. And... Uh, this, uh, this one guy came up and he goes, you're new. And I said, no, I'm not. And he said, uh, oh, what's your name? I haven't seen you here before. I said, uh, my name's Doug and you haven't seen me here before because I've never been here before. So that explains that. Uh, he goes, oh, well, that's what we mean by new, man. You're new. Like you're... You're new. You're new. You've never been here before. And I said, oh, okay. Okay, all right, I'll buy that. I'm new... Like, I've never been here before, but I'm not new like a new member, okay? 
I didn't come here to be like the newest, uh, <laughs> the newest little berry on your tree, you know. I, like, uh, I'm not over here, I, I don't know what it looks like to you, but I'm not over here, help, help, I'm drowning in a sea of alcohol. That's not me, man, that's just not who I am. I'm observing, okay? <laughs> I'm visiting, all right? I'm auditing the class, you know what I'm saying? You know, I'm just checking it out, man, okay? That's what I'm here for. I'm here to check it out. Uh, I, I'm not... Uh, I'm not a joiner, okay? Uh, I just, I never have been, man. I, I'm a loner, you know, uh, 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 an outlaw, uh, uh, a desperado. Uh, uh, uh. I'm a misfit, man. I have been all my life. I, I don't fit in school. Uh, I barely fit in my own damn family. I don't fit in the workplace. You know, I just, I, I'm a loner. I'm a, uh, you know, I just, um, you know, so, uh, so just don't put me on your little roster or whatever, you know, don't. Don't give me your number. Don't ask for mine, you know. Just wave as you pass, you know. I'm just over here minding my own business. Uh, you might try that sometime. See how that works for you. And, uh, and now you, you can't insult you people away. You know, this, guy, this guy's got a big grin. <laughs> I like you. <laughs> yeah, you're going to fit right in. Really? <laughs> really? <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. So the, there was another guy leaning against the wall by the double doors on the other side of the double doors. We're both sitting there cross armed, looking irritated. And everybody else is doing stuff and hugging and laughing and, and setting up chairs and doing stuff. And, and then the, uh, more people filed in. Somebody said, There's some chairs over there if you want to sit down. I said, you know, I've been here a long time. I saw them set up these chairs. I see people come in, they put down a jacket, put down a purse, put down keys, no keys, no purse, no jacket. That seat's available. I get it. I'm a figure outer. But um, <laughs> the fact is I may not be able to stay for your whole deal. So if I have to leave, I don't want to cause a big scene. Excuse me, pardon me, all that. I'm okay standing back here. I'm fine. Back here by the exit, okay? And, and uh, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, I'm just, uh, today I think if somebody said, uh, I don't want to sit down because I may have to leave, I would expect that that meant they were going to get a call or a text or something because they didn't care enough about AA to leave their phone in the car. But anyway, um, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> but, uh, um, I didn't have a phone. Nobody had phones in 86. I mean, people had phones at home. They had answering machines. Some people had pagers. I didn't have a pager either. I didn't need one. Nobody wanted to contact me. What the hell I need a pager for? Um, but what I had was a, a garage door opener with a belt clip on it. And <laughs> it looked cool, you know, like I was somebody important. Like, and it's cool because it never bothers you. And uh, But if you want to use it, like you're in a conversation and your head says, shut up, go get a drink, you can go, oh, uh, i got to get this. I'll be right back. <laughs> Perfect. Unless somebody uh, says, what is that? looks like my garage door opener. <laughs> it is. Uh, it's a combination, uh, garage door opener, pager and uh, TV remote. It's the <laughs> latest, coolest thing. So I said it. Uh, I got one, you know. <laughs> so Anyway, they started the meeting and me and this other cool guy are still standing in the back and I thought, we're the cool section here. You know, we're, we're too cool to sit down. And, and uh, we're standing back at the back when they started the meeting and people read stuff and, and um, The secretary said at one point, we have a birthday tonight. We have a birthday for Ruth for 18 years. And everybody said, yay, Ruth, yay, Ruth. And I thought, I love that, that they celebrate people's birthdays. <laughs> so I'm looking around for Ruth, some 18-year-old tiny Heidi, right? Uh, <laughs> where's Ruth? Ruth gets up. It's a, it's a meeting of, with a stage, you know, like they had a proscenium stage with curtains and everything. You had to walk upstairs to get to it. And Ruth is walking through the audience, and Ruth is 50 if she's a day. And my first thought was, 
God damn, if she's 18, she should stop drinking. Um, <laughs> but she didn't look bad. She looked, she was dressed up and made up and quaffed, you know. I mean, uh, she was coming to take her birthday cake. I didn't know, that, you know, that they had, uh, I didn't know that they, they call them birthdays when people have, but I figured out, okay, this is AA. They don't drink. Ruth hadn't had a drink in 18 years. Maybe it's a national record. I don't know. That's a long time, 18 years. So I thought, well, happy birthday, Ruth. Oh, my God, I cued the choir. I didn't know. I don't know if you do this here, but uh, in California, Southern California, we clap for everything and we sing happy birthday if somebody's having a birthday. So uh, everybody starts, happy birthday to 200 people singing happy birthday in four different keys at the same time. I told you, I, I'm a musician, I, I'm a guitar player, and uh, I know bad singing from good singing. It's, uh, when it's that bad, it's not a hard um, to identify. So, uh, and many of them were not even committed to the key they started in. So, so I'm, I'm kind of surprised, shocked by this. And I looked over at the other cool guy to see if he notices he's singing with him. So I really am the only cool person in the room. And, uh, and they had a piano on stage. They had a baby grand piano with a sheet over it. And I thought somebody in this room can play. I still believe any group of 200 Americans, average Americans, somebody can fake happy birthday on the piano. It's not hard. It's a three-chord song, CGD. And... Um, I thought I could do it. I'm not even a piano player, and I could. Die. Maybe I should. Do him a favor, you know. Be a big hero. Run up there, yank that sheet off of there. Here I come to save the day, you know, and get everybody in the same key. And then I, all of a sudden, I had this little, like a little tiny sponsor thought, you know. You know, sometimes that hero thing doesn't work out like you think it's going to. Why don't you just shut up? It's a short song. So, the happy birthday, keep coming back. And then Ruth gets up and these girls have this cake and she blows the candles out. And everybody claps and she says, I, my name's Ruth and I'm an alcoholic. And everybody, of course, goes, hi, Ruth. And I, <laughs> it's like, this is like kindergarten or something. My friend Scott used to say, this is some level of lameness I never knew was available to me. So, so Ruth says, I want you to know that over these last 18 years of sobriety, I've attended a meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous every single day. Well, I didn't know they had AA meetings every single day, let alone that you would go to one every day for 18 years. I was just, I, 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 just, I didn't know how to take it. And I looked over at the other cool guy to see if he's giggling at this. And then I realized I'm really alone. This guy is a member. I know that because now he's heading over to me and he's got his hand out like we do, you know, and that sunbeam for Jesus smile. <laughs> and he takes my hand in both hands and he says, hey, I'll tell you what, you stay sober a year, we'll give you one of them cakes. Okay, that isn't weird. <laughs> don't, don't drink for a year and you get a cake. <laughs> I don't really know anything about this guy like I thought I did. I, he, only thing I know about him, he values cake more than I do. Because to me, it seemed like if you don't drink for a year, you ought to get a car. <laughs> you know, something. And I just, I was too shocked to make fun of him. I, I, I said, uh, I'm not much of a pastry eater, you know. Um, 
if I wanted a, a cake, I'd just stop at Safeway on the way home. I, you know, I think, I think they're like five bucks. Uh, yeah, or I could not drink for a year. Hmm. <laughs> I told, uh, in fact, it wouldn't even be out of my way. I got to stop and get a six pack anyway. Um, but, um, but thank you. And so then, uh, People read stuff, like I said, and, uh, and somebody talked for an hour. It was a speaker meeting. I can't tell you if the speaker was a man or a woman, let alone what he or she said. That's how important the speakers are. <laughs> we, we just kind of fill up time, you know, so, so people can digest their food. And, um, uh, but I remember that at some point the secretary is like, blah, 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 and this is our big book, Alcoholics Anonymous, the basic text of our program. It's the only authority on AA. I heard her say that. It's the only authority on AA. And she said, if you're new, please don't leave without this book. So we established I'm new, so I will steal the book. And uh, they had a bunch of them on a table with some other stuff, and I realized I could go pick up that book, act like I'm fascinated with it, and walk right out the door. Wow, this is going to really help. I'm so, oh, this, man, this is great. And walk right out the door, and I had a feeling... Um, if they, if they even noticed, they'd say, let them go. And I still think that might have happened. I didn't get to test that because she said, uh, if you're new and you're financially embarrassed, we understand that. We've been there. We want you to have this book. We'll make very liberal credit arrangements, including nothing down and nothing a week till you get back on your feet. True. So now if I steal the book, you're going to think I'm homeless. And... Uh, <laughs> I'm barely holding on to it, but I got a job, and uh, I got money. It's a hardcover book. It's probably 20, 25 bucks, you know. Um, so I got to wait till the end of the meeting so I can go up and buy one of the books. And I went up to her afterwards. I said, excuse me, ma'am, can, uh, can I buy one of your books? She said, oh, the big book? Yeah, the big book. Yeah, I've seen bigger. Um <laughs> How much is that big book? She said, it's, uh, it's four sixty-five. Do you have it? It's four dollars and sixty-five cents? Yeah, I think I can handle that. Here's a, uh, here's a five. Keep the change. <laughs> she said, no, I'll get your change. No, lady, I'm, listen, I'm very serious about this. I want you to keep the change in. Use that change to help a drunk, because I'm on my feet, okay? So, um, she said, okay, so she gave me, I got the big book, and on the way home, I stopped and got a bottle of whiskey. So I get home with my big book and my fifth of whiskey, and I poured about three fingers of whiskey, and I sat down to read this book. And I did not stay up all night studying the book. I have the ability to look at the title of a chapter, almost any book, and pretty much know everything in the chapter. It's, uh... <laughs> Just a gift that I have, and uh, so um, of course I didn't bother with the doctor's opinion. I've had doctor's opinions, so I don't need that one. I got into the chapter one, Bill's story. Who cares? Chapter two. <laughs> chapter two. There's a solution. That's a sales pitch. Young man, there's a solution to your problem. The twelve steps of Alcoholics Anonymous will give you a life beyond your wildest drunken dreams. Uh, great. Chapter 3, more about alcoholism. Now, that sounded like it actually could be the most boring piece of literature in the English language. So I'm going to save that one until I'm tweaking some night, you know. feel like I got toothpicks in my eyelids. And more about alcoholism. So I'm already up to Chapter 4, We Agnostics. <laughs> we Agnostics. When I walked into my first AA meeting, I expected to find a bunch of people who used to drink like I drink, and don't anymore, I believe that, and we're atheists and agnostics. Because um, my grandmother, who was a drunk, who got sober when she found Jesus, and she was sober 37 years, she became a Pentecostal minister, four-square gospel minister. And she opened a Skid Row mission in San Pedro, California, on Beacon Street in San Pedro, if you know that area. And at that time in the 50s, it was a very, very rough area. And people got killed there. Somebody got killed on Beacon Street almost every night at that time. And uh, my grandmother's little white dove Pentecostal mission was right there. And she would bring these wharf rats and winos in. 
and save their lives, save their souls. And they stopped drinking. And, and she quit drinking and she quit smoking. And she hated AA. And I always thought she hated AA because there was no God here. Because people got sober without God. And when you come here, you don't have to be here five minutes before you hear my higher power, power greater than myself, humbly asked him with a capital H, admitted to God, prayed to God, told God, oh my God, God, the last house on the block is Sunday school. Are you kidding me? And I was so irritated. But now I'm reading this book. The secretary had said was the only authority. It's got a whole chapter called We Agnostics. I was so elated. I poured another three fingers of whiskey and I read... Chapter 4, all the way through. And I finished, I thought, I have absolutely no idea what I just read. So, I poured some more whiskey and I read it again. And then I poured some more whiskey and I read it again. I'm looking for how the smart people stay sober without God, and it's not in there. But there's a couple of things in there. One of them is a sentence that on my probably third reading jumped off the page at me. Very subtle, but incredibly significant. It said... We found that God doesn't make too hard terms on those who seek Him. I, thought, I never heard that before. Anybody I ever heard talk about God, whichever, and I, you know, I knew something about religions of the world, Western and Eastern, and it seemed to me, in my drunken opinion of organized religion, that every religion said you have to jump through spiritual hoops to get God's attention. My grandmother's Pentecostal. Church never said that. Uh, they, in fact, they would say just the opposite. You know, uh, they had a way of saying my one-syllable name in less than a syllable, you know. Hello. Uh, I do hope you brought your guitar. We're going to make a joyful noise tonight. And uh, They would say, you know, uh, we are very sure that God makes hard times on those who seek Him. Boy, you know God will not even hear your prayers unless you're baptized. And I don't mean sprinkled on the forehead like some Methodist. No. No, I'm talking about total submission, boy. Total submission. That's why we got to take a water for Christ up here. Come on up, son. We don't soak you down, pull you up, washed in the blood of the Lamb. Praise Jesus. Amen. Somebody get the boy a towel. And, uh, you know... <laughs> I'm like 14 years old that I am not getting wet in this room tonight. I, I, I'm absolutely positive my grandmother would die before she'd let him drown her only grandson, but she's a little bitty thing. These are big old fat guys, and maybe she told him I touched myself. I don't know. You know, They could be sending my ass to Jesus for my own good as far as I could tell. You know, So I'm like, I said, I, you know what? I got brand new Levi's on. Shrink to fit. You know what I'm saying? Like... Uh, if I get in that tank, man, I won't be able to ride my bicycle home. <laughs> so, yeah, I'll be back. You know, psh, I'm out of there. But it wasn't just the Pentecostals. My girlfriend was Catholic. She had to go to confession, communion, confirmation, a bunch of other cons to um, determine how many Hail Marys and Our Fathers would cleanse her soul of the various kinds of sins. I know we got Catholics in here. Validate me. Catholics don't have sin. They got them categorized. They got levels of sin. Venial, menial, cardinal, mortal. Some of them, you don't even have to do them. If you think about them, express way to hell, partner. Like, you could, you could go to hell for thinking about sin. You could burn in perdition for eternity for thinking about sin. And I remember, okay, this is not going to be my deal here. I'm, not, I'm out of here, but I wonder how long I could actually go without thinking about Oh, shit. And, uh, <laughs> My friend Michael was an Orthodox Jew, and he and his brother Sherm had to wear spit girls to school. So I'm thinking, oh, there's a loving God for you, all right? Uh, went over to their house for dinner one night. His mom says, Doug, welcome to our home. It's an honor to have you. Would you like to join us in some wine and hala? <laughs> some what? She said, would you like to join our family in some wine and hala? I said, well, I'll have some wine. I, uh, I'm not much of a pastry eater, uh, Mrs. Stein. And, uh, and then there were Buddhists and Hindus and Muslims. Oh, my. So uh, by the time I got to AA, I'm like, here's the line. All the religions of the world over there, I'll be over here making fun of you. And that's the guy that came to AA. I didn't have an epiphany when I read that, that uh, God doesn't make too hard terms. 
or that you don't have to accept anyone's concept of God, find one you're comfortable with that seems to be okay with the Creator. I understood what that said, but it was just such a new concept. I had to go back to AA. And I knew I had a problem with alcohol. I was kind of hoping that I was the kind of alcoholic who didn't have to stop altogether. That once I got a little handle on my drinking, even if I had to stop for a couple of months, that I could have a cold beer on a hot day. It just makes sense, you know. Or a glass of wine with dinner. You know, I'll be a 12-ounce porterhouse, please, medium rare, and a nice dry red. Maybe a Beaujolais or a Pinot Noir or a Petite Syrah. What year petites do you have? You know what I'm saying? You know, that's a responsible adult beverage consumption. That's what I'm looking for. A margarita with my enchilada. You know, a, a little sake with my sushi. Or sometimes get a fifth of whiskey and chug it down and have an inappropriate experience. But, uh, but just not all the time. And so uh, I went to AA for eight months. And I went five, six, seven times a week for eight months. Went to different groups. Because uh, I really didn't want anybody to get to know me, so I didn't have a home group. I didn't have a sponsor. I didn't read the book. I didn't take the steps. I didn't know what a tradition was. I didn't have a commitment anywhere. I didn't believe in God, and I was drinking every day. So, except for that, I had a pretty good program. But, um, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> finally, I, I came home from a meeting one night. It's about 10:30 at night, and I laid on the floor and opened a bottle of whiskey and watch TV until I passed out, woke up in the middle of the night, about 3 a.m. I used to do that a lot, wake up about 3 a.m., bottles half full. I don't know where the cap is. I got it. I crawled on my hands and knees through the living room, through the hallway, into the bedroom to go to bed. Some people call it pitiful and incomprehensible demoralization. I, I just call it going to bed. Um, <laughs> I mean, the first time I thought of it, I thought, hey, I thought it was brilliant. You can't fall off the floor. So... Uh, I got into my bedroom and I stood up to get undressed and I fell. As soon as I stood up, I fell on my knees and I spilled this whiskey all over the bed. God, I picked it up and most of it's in there. There was still some in the bottle. Most of it's in the bedspread. So I set that bottle in a safe place and I grabbed the bedspread and started sucking whiskey out of it. And a voice in my head said, hey, Amen. that ain't right. You, uh, you thirsty? There's whiskey in the bottle, man. <laughs> Not thirsty, I'm frugal. I, uh, I waste my life, but I'm not letting the whiskey evaporate in the bedspread overnight. And, uh, look what I was doing, and I knew, you know, that only an alcoholic would do that. It didn't surprise me. I knew I was an alcoholic, but I didn't know what to do about it. All of a sudden, I was out of ideas. I always had some kind of idea, you know, maybe this, maybe that. I was out of ideas. And I've been going to AA for eight months, and I've been hearing you people talk about things. And I heard a lot of people say this. They ask God for help. And people told me, if you ask God for help, the help will come. I thought it was a metaphor or something, but I, I'm out of ideas, so I just said, God, if you're there, please help me. And I went to bed, and I went to sleep. And over the next couple of weeks, every single day, something odd would happen. Not, not like the parting of the Red Sea, just something odd. One in my neighborhood liquor store. Everybody behind that counter, day or night, knows who I am. They know what I drink. All they need to know is pint or half pint, really. And uh, I walked in there the next day. This guy from AA behind the counter. And by the way, I'm lying about my sobriety. I'm taking, I got four different sobriety dates at four different groups. I'm taking bogus chips. And uh, so I don't remember how much time this guy thinks I have, you know, or if he even cares. But I said, what are you doing in here? He said, no, what are you doing in here? I said, I just I came to get some cigarettes, you know, so I, Got my smokes, and I went someplace else and got a bottle. But then I'm in the, in the liquor department of the supermarket, reach up for a bottle. Somebody from AA is pushing a cart towards me. Hey, one day at a time. Keep it simple. And uh, I'm at a restaurant in Burbank across from NBC. I went over for lunch, and uh, the waitress is somebody I know from AA. This is happening to me every day. Somebody from AA between me and a drink. And it didn't keep me from drinking. It just created little hurdles I was happy to jump over. But it's happening every day, and I can't ignore it. Finally, I'm on the way to work after a couple of weeks, literally 14 days of this. And uh, I just killed a half pint of Bushmills at 3 a.m. Or not 3 a.m., 6.30 a.m. And uh, I'm on the way to work. And uh, I just killed this half pint of Bushmills, and I don't keep empty bottles in the car. They're illegal and useless. And... Uh, I rolled down the window and tossed this bottle out the window just as the guy from AA is driving towards me. He saw me and waved, and I threw a bottle in front of his car. Bang, bang, bang. 
And I thought, where are these people coming from? God, they're like, they're like cockroaches. Really? Have we seen a person fail? <laughs> so they're just like those stupid miracles they talk about in AA. And as soon as I thought the word miracle was like I could hear God laughing. <laughs> I pulled the car over to the side of the road and I sat there and I came to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I didn't know I was at the second step. It's clear now. But uh, it was the beginning of my sobriety, the beginning of hearing the music of Alcoholics Anonymous. I think there's a rhythm and a harmony and a melody that runs through this thing that makes the, the words make sense. The words don't always make sense till they're set to music. And... Uh, if, uh, if you wonder, if you're new and you're wondering, what the hell is this idiot talking about the music of AA? Um, you stick around. And if, and if you're older, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Um, but I started to do things right. I got a sponsor. I'm going to meetings, washing coffee cups and ashtrays. And uh, I, um, I didn't read the book. My sponsor didn't tell me to read the book for some reason. So... Uh, but I, I and I'm a slow reader, but I'm I got a good memory. So people would quote the book in in uh, meetings, and I just remember what they said. It's dangerous because sometimes people misquote the book. Uh, but you know, you get things like, uh, well, you know, it says that they give you a page number sometimes. It says on page 84 that uh, love and tolerance of others is our code. That one happens to be accurate, but all the stuff I was quoting wasn't necessarily. And a lady said, our book says, I'm yes, <laughs> our book says that our drinking was but a symptom of deeper underlying causes and conditions. Huh. I hadn't, I didn't, hadn't heard that before. And, and honestly, that's not an exact quote, but it's close enough. It's a good paraphrase. But then she went on to say stuff that was not in the book at all, not even suggested, that if you don't find your deeper underlying cause and condition, you're going to drink again. And that scared me because I don't know what my deeper underlying cause and condition. I told you about my first drink. I told you about my family. I don't know what my deeper... I just started drinking. I liked it and it just got out of hand. I don't... Deeper underlying cause and condition. Oh, my God. I, so I started looking for it, you know, and I thought, oh, my God, when I was 24 years old, I had just moved from Orange County up to Hollywood to try to make a living making music. And I was getting some, some work. I was playing bass in a band. I was, uh, somebody would say, would you play harmonica on my, on my record or would you sing background? I wrote a song. I co-wrote another song. I was making, I was paying the rent. And there was a show that came to town. It was a Broadway musical called Hair. And it just opened in Hollywood. And I went to see it and I fell in love with it. It's like, I love Broadway musicals anyway. Flower Drum Song and Oklahoma and, you know, Music Man, all that stuff. And this was like a Broadway musical about hippies with rock and roll music. And I just fell in love with it. And there was a character named Berger that stripped down to a loincloth, swung on a rope, screamed rock and roll, and insulted the audience. And I thought, I could do that. <laughs> so I, the next day, I called the Aquarius Theater. And, and the uh, receptionist said, Aquarius Theater, may I help you? I said, yeah, I want to be in your show. She said, just a minute, I'll connect you. See, I don't think this can happen today. 1969 was a different world. She connected me to the company manager, and he said, can I help you? I said, I want to be in your show. He said, well, can you sing and dance? I said, that's what I do for a living, man. <laughs> that's what I do. And I, and I never danced a step in my life. I'm up on the bandstand watching you dance. Good dancing, bad dancing, how hard could it be? So, um, but I was comfortable with my singing, so I, I, I said, yeah. And he said, uh, what are you doing Friday at 1 o'clock? I said, you tell me. He said, yeah, be here at 1 o'clock. We're having auditions. What's your name? I told him, and he said, Bring a piece of sheet music. We got a piano player. Bring a piece of sheet music. We want to hear you sing. Okay. So I went right down to the music store. I bought a piece of sheet music that I like to sing. Went home and practiced it all night long. This is on a Wednesday. Thursday, I practiced it again all day. And uh, Friday morning, I got my guitar out and I practiced this song. And I broke a string on my guitar, which hippies were like, oh, bad karma, dude. So um, I went to my roommate's room to see if he had the string because he was a guitar player. Right in the middle of his dresser, a little envelope with a D string on it. <laughs> there it is. Good karma, dude. So I picked it up. Underneath the envelope was a little white capsule. And I thought, I wonder what that is. Um, nope. Because <laughs> we didn't have a PDR. You pretty much had to swallow test everything. And, and uh, it's a good test. Forget about motor vehicles and heavy machinery and all that stuff. If you eat it, you're going to know exactly what it does. You can pass that information along. And if somebody dies... Don't eat the green shit. So um, this turned out to be THC, synthetic marijuana. And uh, 
a nice little psychedelic. So 45 minutes later, when I got down to the Aquarius Theater, I went down on my scooter, and I got down there, and I, par- I had my music in my right hand, and I turned off the bike, and I put the kickstand down, and it seemed like it took me about three minutes to swing my leg over. Like, <laughs> all right. <laughs> I'm feeling very loose. Uh, and I sort of floated up the stairs at the Aquarius Theater, and my hair was long over my shoulders at the time. It just swished when I walked. <laughs> and I had these hip hugger bell bottoms on, big bells like that. They call them elephant bells. And they're boom, 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 boom. And I had no shirt on. I'm wearing this vest with six layers of foot long red, white, and blue leather fringe. That was a walking wind chime. And. Uh, <laughs> I floated up the stairs and into the lobby and into the auditorium, and I see people are already down there auditioning. And I'm, and I'm looking at these, and I'm thinking, God damn, these hippies can sing and dance, man. I almost forgot why I was there. Till somebody said, uh, Doug Rowell, is Doug Rowell here? I said, yep, yep. Went running down the aisle and up on stage, and I handed my music to the piano player, and he opens it up, big grin, and he starts to play Bum, 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 bum. I said, what? I feel good. And I went into this James Brown number and I thought I was the godfather of soul. And I'm down on one knee and I'm back up and, oh, what? I hold you. <laughs> I'm into it, you know. And uh, at the end, bum, 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 wow. And, and he said, uh, this guy that was, that was head of the, like the judges, he goes, man, we love you. We love your energy. Can you do something a little mellower just so we kind of get a range? And I said, no problem. I went into this a cappella version of Otis Redding's Dock of the Bay. And the piano player knew the tune, so he just picked it up. And we were right in the pocket. <laughs> Looks like nothing gonna change. I made myself cry. And... Uh, <laughs> Everything still remains the same. And uh, finished up and they said, great, man, we love you. We love you. We just got to see you dance. <laughs> yeah, but by now I'm okay, you know. <laughs> I never dance, but let's give it a shot. So I, I said to the piano player, hit it. And I started to move. And I suspect initially I probably looked like the offspring of Joe Cocker and Julia Louis Dreyfus, you know, just sort of a... But uh, but it got good to me, <laughs> and I'm seeing, I'm feeling it. I'm seeing uh, my hair is coming around. I'm seeing trails off of my hair, <laughs> and I'm seeing trails off this fringe. <laughs> and I'm in this tornado of trails, and I heard somebody say, "Jesus, can he dance?" and uh, <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous, or <laughs> Alcoholics Anonymous, alcohol and drugs doing for me what I could not do for myself. <laughs> and uh, they hired me. They hired me, but I thought I was auditioning for the Hollywood show. They were auditioning for the Las Vegas show. So it was Friday. They said, report to Las Vegas to the um, International Hotel at, uh, on Tuesday, Tuesday afternoon. So I said, okay. So I got my fares in order over the weekend. Ate a tab of orange sunshine, got on my Harley and headed out <laughs> to make my fame and fortune. And uh, I got to Las Vegas and I got in the company. It took about three days to learn the show. And then I, then I was doing the show for a while with the company. And then they gave me the understudy role of this character, Burger. And so every about two times a week, I would play this character, Burger. And then when we left Las Vegas after six months, they gave me the lead role, Burger, the obnoxious, sex-crazed leader of the tribe. <laughs> For, you know, speed freak. And I was like, oh, well, okay, it's a stretch, but I could do it. And, uh, <laughs> and we toured the United States and Canada for three and a half years, you know. Uh, played all over the United States and Canada. And, and uh, we'd do two weeks here and a week, three weeks, whatever. And, and uh, people would come up on the stage. We'd invite people up on the stage afterwards. You know, come up and dance with us. they come up. And, and, uh, <laughs> and uh, <laughs> somebody would say, uh, hey, man. We we own this bar down the street, and uh, we're having we're going to close it tonight, and just have you guys over. Come on over and just be our friends, and you and drinks are on the house, and we go over and we just drink all night for free. And the gay bars loved us; they would always do that. And and uh, uh, then the 
<laughs> Somebody would say, hey man, you like pot? Here, send some me in Maui, Waui, Panama Red, Acapulco Gold, give us all this great dope because we could sing and dance, you know. And uh, some girl would go, oh my God, I love you. Take me. <laughs> go, okay, you know. <laughs> so, so, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and travel around the country getting paid for it. It was a good job, really, but uh, I look back at it from my newfound sobriety and I realize how they had used me. Uh, <laughs> you don't realize how you're being victimized when you're right in the middle of it, you know, but looking back. I just wanted to sing and dance and make people happy, uh, and, they, and they may be an alcoholic. I called my sponsor and told him, I said, I found out my deeper underlying cause and condition. He said, oh, let's hear that. Hair. He said, well, we, we have to cut your hair to keep you sober. Not my hair, the show. Remember I told you I was a big star, I traveled around the country. He said, oh, I forgot about the big star deal. Yeah, because you know, you're drunk now, but um, I thought you were loaded when you auditioned for that show. Yeah, I told him too much. And uh, I said, yeah. And he said, I'm going to go out on a limb and figure you had a problem before you ever got in that show. So, okay, I get it. Then I don't know what my deep underlying cause and condition is. And he said, don't worry about it. I don't know what mine is. But I started to do the things that were suggested around here to do. And it's made my life happier and happier. Carla and I got together about six years ago. We knew each other for 10 or 12 years before that in, a and in L.A., in AA, and we liked and respected each other, but we had to go to Arizona to start talking and getting serious. And on the plane ride back from Phoenix, I, uh, I asked her on a date. I said, you want to go see a play with me? And she said, yeah, so we've been playing ever since. And we, uh, we, have, uh, we have a great life, you know. Um, Bill was, was at our wedding at our home, and, uh, uh, and we had about 200 family and AA friends there. And we just have this wonderful, beautiful life now. Um, if you're new and you're wondering, what is this moron talking about the music of AA? I think it's the laughter. We come in here sick unto death and dying and feeling like we'll never laugh again. And after a while, you hear somebody laughing and you realize it's you. And we start to laugh. And we laugh ourselves weller than we were before we got sick. What an incredible deal. The treatment... The treatment for a terminal illness, which would kill us otherwise, is to come in and hang out with a bunch of your friends, take these 12 suggested steps, and laugh yourself weller than we were before we got sick. It's an incredible gift. And yet there are people in this room, and people in rooms like this all over the world, who will say, no thanks, I'd rather get loaded. And we understand that. We get it. But if you're new, you don't have to be that one. You can be the one that does, gets a sponsor and does all the stupid stuff they tell you to do, even, just, even if it's just to prove it won't work. And watch your life turn golden in front of your eyes. If you don't drink for a year, we'll give you a cake. <laughs> Thanks for letting me share. <laughs>